yeah, we are about to start our lecture. So this is the second lecture, the second information visualization lecture in this in our course for DV807. Uh, the same things, more or less the same things I said last time uh, uh, also apply now. So it is a compressed crash course in information visualization, just basic concepts, basic notions that should be uh, just enough to, you know, get you started in things and then get you in the right direction if you need to go and, and you know, look for more details yourself. And obviously, there's also the fact that you're also already having the other uh, visualization course. So that also means that you will get more details there because that other course is really much, much more detailed, uh, much more in-depth than what we have here. I have checked the, the lectures from 40 V8 805, right? Yeah, I have checked the lectures and I did not find a lot of overlap because I, I could see that Andreas really um, changed some of these slides from, from last year. So there is not a lot of overlap. There is a little bit, but not much. Uh, so hopefully uh, you still get something, something interesting from, from both uh, visualizations, uh, visualization lectures. And with that, I'm about to start. So, um, yeah, so the, the aims of this the, the lectures today are to keep basically keep on pushing on what we talked about last time and to recognize the design space of visual mappings currently available for each data set and data attribute type. We talked already a little bit about the data attributes when we looked at that, uh, let's say taxonomy or uh, that uh, definition, those definitions from Tamara Munzner, where she uh, gave this, this rough list of which mappings are more interesting for each attribute type, right? Uh, based on research and everything. But now we're gonna talk about actual data sets, uh, different data set types and things like that. And also identify the strengths and weaknesses of different visualization techniques because, uh, you know, visualizations like this, even though there is a small core of, of techniques that are used by most people, these, these more classic things that are, you know, hard to, to get away from because you're just used to them. Um, the truth is that the design space is immense. So every different kind of data set type that you could have uh, that you could get your hands on will have so many different possibilities of visualizations. And, and some of them are better for some things, some of them are better for other things. So there's no like silver bullet when it comes to visualization. You don't have just one visualization that, that covers everything. It's, it's really a very, although there is a, there is a subjective like design uh, thing where you have to, I mean, it's not completely mathematical, so to speak. You know, it's not exactly like these are the pros, these are the cons, and then this is definitely the, the best one. So there is this subjective, more like a design approach to it in, in terms of uh, you making decisions and choosing something that's also uh, pleasing, let's say aesthetically. Um, there are some things that you must keep in mind. Uh, there are the, some things are very objective, like this one is good for this and that one is good for that in, in some senses. So we, we will try to, I will try to give just a, just a basic overview of, the, of those things. It's by no means an in-depth uh, treatment or anything like that. For that you will, in, at least in this course, you will have to kind of, if you need to go in-depth in some, something specific, then you will have to go uh, by yourself most of the time. If we go back to the information visualization pipeline as we had defined last week, then we are still in this first step of transforming source data into data tables. Or into, if you don't, maybe data tables might be a little bit of a restrictive term. You could just think of uh, structured data in general, even if it's not a table, uh, because there, there are other types of structured data that are not tables. Although tables are the most common, right? Uh, but we're still we're still in this step right now. But um, 
instead of talking about actual data tables like we did last time, we're going to talk about, we we'll start talking about networks, first of all. Last time when we, when we discussed data attributes and everything, we were talking about actual tables, actual tables, right? Where with rows and columns. And sometimes we call them a multidimensional data sets, for example, because each column can be seen as a dimension from, from a certain space where the data came from. We don't know what space that is. I mean, it's, it depends on the data, right? Uh, what are the restrictions of each dimension and so on and so forth. But we can, we can kind of uh, think of it in an abstract way as, as a data set that was sampled from a multidimensional space. And that's what a table is um, in, in a way. You can think of it like that. When it comes to networks, you can drop that. Forget about the, the tables. Uh, in general, a network is something else completely, right? In general, uh, a network or a graph, as we call it, as, uh, actually, I'm more used to using the term graph, although I understand that networks is sometimes a little bit more intuitive to people who are not necessarily working with visualization and, and data analysis uh, every day. So graph might not be so intuitive. So, but for us right now in our course or in our lecture, just think of a network and a graph as exactly the same thing. The most important things about a data set that is, that, that is a network or a graph are the relationships between items, okay? So relationships between items are explicit. In a, in a data table, if you, take two, uh, if you take two points, which are actually the, the two rows of the data, the, the data table or any two rows from a data table are two data points. And if you take them, if you pick them, you don't, you can, you can create a relationship between them, for example, by computing a distance, right? Like an Euclidean distance, you can do that. You can do that between any point in, a, in an Euclidean space. However, that relationship is implicit. It's not there in the first place. You have extracted it, right? When it comes to networks, these relations are not only explicit, but they are basically what, what shapes your data set. The data set, you, you could even say that the data set is the set of relationships between items. Of course, every item will also have most of the time we'll also have characteristics like like for example in in this example each item also call, called a node or a vertex again this is just interchangeable for us uh, a node or a vector or a vertex or a, a network item so to speak um, all interchangeable so for example in this case the nodes are persons or people right the fact that they are uh, people or uh, they, they have, they may have some characteristics. They may have like color of hair or uh, salary or type of job or whatever, favorite movie, anything like that. Those things could be added on top of the network if you want when you're dealing with networks. But the important part are the relationships between the, the persons or the, in the network, okay? This is, this is what defines the structure of your data set. Uh, these relationships are usually called links or, ed or edges. Um, I have uh, a tendency to call them nodes and edges. There's no spe special reason for that. It's just that I'm used to it. Uh, and this, these relationships are, they have, usually they have some meaning, right? Like for example, in this case, it's friendship in a social network. So in a social network, you have people who are nodes and then relationships between them which are friendships, like I'm friends with someone. And when you take all of these friendships at, at the same time, and you consider them all as one data set, that is a network, okay? Now, one thing that's interesting to think about uh, networks or graphs, in this case, I'm talking, I'm not using the word graphs here, is that even though we kind of think of them in a visual way, like, like what I have here in the bottom, uh, this is usually, I, I will guess, I can know for sure, but I will guess that whenever I say the word network or graph, you guys will 
re, uh, like think about something like this or maybe something larger uh, like like those examples of very big networks that sometimes people um, post in, in pl different places. So I'm guessing that you're thinking about something like this, but the truth is that a graph or a network is a purely mathematical abstract thing. It doesn't really have one specific visual representation that is, it has to be like that period. And we will, we will discuss that as we go with the slides, but I want you guys to think about the fact that if we go back again, all the way back to those to that information visualization pipeline, you will see that at this point, we are still talking about the mapping between data and structured data, like source data and structured data or data tables. So we're not talking about anything related to the actual visualization, right? And for that, for that, um, for, for the fact, I want you guys to forget a little bit about the fact that a network or a graph has an implicit representation in your mind and just accept or at least try to, to understand the fact that initially, before they're visualized, they are just, just an abstract, shapeless, mathematical, let's say, concept or um, from formulation. So they're abstract structures that can be used for modeling relational information. Relational information is just a fancy word for saying relationships or links or edges between nodes. And, and actually you can think of a graph as exactly this, G equals VE like this. Because you have V, which is a set of nodes or objects or items. And you have E, which is a set of edges, which are the actual relationships between the objects. Okay, so V is a set, E is a set, and then G, the graph, is simply the combination of these two things, the V and the E. And the reason why we use the word set here also has an actual meaning, like there's, it's not just a word, it's, it, we use the word set because we're basically saying it's a collection of things, it's like a, a bucket of things, but there is no specific ordering or a specific um, way to, to see them. They're just individual things that were put in a bucket. And that's what a set is when you think about it more like in a mathematical way. Uh, when, you, when you say a set, it just means that it's a bunch of stuff that are in the same like bucket, but they don't really have any uh, ordering between them. It's not a list, for example. A list has an order, right? It's this thing and then this thing and then this thing, and that has a meaning. Uh, so I couldn't, for, for example, I couldn't just say V is a list of nodes, even though it might feel like, yeah, it's okay because it doesn't matter. It actually matters because lists and sets are completely, well, are, are significantly different when it comes to mathematical definitions. Okay. So they're actually sets of nodes and sets of edges and not lists or collections or anything like that. I mean, collection is an abstract word, so maybe you could use that, but anyway, data structure, uh, what is this? this? These are two different ways that you usually represent a graph when you save it in a file, for example, right? Uh, the adjacency matrix and the adjacency list. These are, these are things that could be just one lecture by itself, so I cannot, unfortunately, go into details with them. Um, but an adjacency matrix, it's simply a matrix where, for example, if you have 100 nodes in your not network, then your matrix would have 100 rows and 100 columns. And then it's either zero or one. Zero means that this, these two points, like one, one, they're not connected. And of course, one, one is not connected because you, usually you're not connected to yourself, right? Because usually that doesn't make any sense. But one, in this case, if you take row one and column two, then that's a number one here. And that means that one and two are indeed connected. And that's actually this, this one here. So you can see that one and two are connected. And then you can see that two and, well, two and one are obviously connected because this is symmetric. Then two and three are connected because two is connected to three. And then three, and, and again, it's symmetric, so three and two are connected. But if you, took, if you look at one and three, then you see it's a zero because one and three are not connected, okay? So that's an adjacency matrix. And there are some, uh, some changes, some different uh, possibilities here. For example, 
uh, these connections are right now all just one because we're all we're only saying they're connected period we don't care if there is like a strength of connection but it could have sometimes you have a graph where this actually has a number so maybe the connection between one and two is stronger than the connection between two and three so you can add an information here like a number two three four something that represents the fact that this relationship is stronger than this other relationship and this is one way to represent a graph on disk um, and again i could talk a whole lecture about this but then there is an adjacency list that's an alternative way it's the same thing but uh, done in a different way which is for example take uh, each row is one node now so for example node one and then you put a, a, a column here and you say two, which means one is connected to two. Then you go for the second row and okay, the second row is node two uh, here, and then you have one and three. So that means two is connected to one and two is connected to three. And then third row number two means that three is connected back to two. Now, why would you have these two things? Well, most graphs will not have so many connections between the nodes i mean if you have it because the the total amount of possible theoretical connections between the nodes is n squared right so if you have or it's at least equivalent to n squared it might not be exactly n squared because of the diagonal but it's equivalent to n squared because you have since you have n uh, let's say n nodes uh, then you have n times n, which is every node could be potentially connected to every other node. So then you have n times n, that's n squared. And, and if, you, if you use an adjacency matrix, you have like too many zeros. This file here becomes a gigantic file, depending on whether you have a lot of uh, nodes, right? Imagine you have 1 million nodes, then 1 million times 1 million, I don't even know, how to say that number and then you would have like a really huge file full of zeros just zero 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 all everywhere because usually usually networks don't really get even close to the total possible amount of connections between nodes usually the the nodes are connected between each other in in, in very clear like patterns so then you use an adjacency list because in, a, in an adjacency list you only have the, the edges that you are actually using so you don't waste space with with possible connections that are never there right but again there are also advantages to the adjacency matrix because the adjacency matrix is much easier to 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 deal with like for example i want to know is there a connection between one and three well one three no there is no connection that's immediate it's actually a lookup one lookup but with an adjacency list it's not that easy because then you have to first look for the node like well in this case it's one but if it was something down there then you have to first look for the node and then look for all the the possible connections and so on but usually usually adjacency list is more practical unless you really have to do a lot of lookup and then you might use this one anyway these are two, the, the two most common ways to store a graph on disk, right? So the reason why I'm talking about this is because we're in the, the part of the pipeline where we are talking about how to structure data, right? So uh, this is how you structure a graph. But then there's graph drawing, which is actually visualization, which is automatic drawing of graphs in 2D and 3D. So then our techniques, graph drawings, usually known as the technique, techniques for drawing graphs in a screen. And for example, this is one possible drawing for this graph. It's not the same, the only one. This is one possible way to draw this graph. There are actually infinite ones, but this, I would guess this is probably the most common that comes to, to mind when you think about it. Well, there's some stuff about graphs. Graphs can have cycles or not. If a graph has cycles, then it means that it's possible that uh, nodes are connected to themselves. So then the diagonal of that adjacency matrix would not be completely zero. It would, uh, it would have actually have connections because that depends on the data set. That depends on the phenomenon that you're representing with the data set, whether that phenomenon 
make whether it makes sense to have a cycle in that data set. Also, edge is going to be directed or undirected. In, in our previous examples, they're all undirected. So if two is connected to one, then one is connected to two. But the truth is that sometimes they're directed. So sometimes one is connected to two, but two is not connected to one. So then you would see like an arrow usually uh, in, in the most common visualization. And, and that also depends on the data and depends on whether that makes sense for the data. So for example, maybe you have some kind of, um, I don't know, some kind of a roadblock or something that only lets you get into a place but doesn't let you get go back. And then you have to take another road, for example, to go back. I don't know, something like this, like a road that goes just one way. So I can go from my house to the supermarket using this street because it goes this way. But if I want this to go, if I want to go from the supermarket back to my to my house, then I take gotta take another ro road that goes by another place and then comes back to my place or something like this. So I cannot just go in, uh, go in and then go back using the same road. For example, that's one simple one. Most commonly, they're undirected. The degree of a node is the number of edges that are connected with this node. So when I say the node degree is this or that, that means that basically just means how many edges do we have in this node. And if it's directed, then, then you have two degrees. You have the in degree and the out degree. So the degree of uh, the number of incoming edges and the number of coming edges. These are just ways of, um, let's say, <clears throat> representing or, or talking about the nodes, right? And like I said, the edges can also have values. We usually call them edge weights uh, with different types. So, so like I said before, maybe you could have a number here, two, three, four, that would give a weight to your edge that would tell somehow that your edge is different than the others, either more valuable or less valuable or something like that. Uh, so again, we're talking only about the struct, the, the, the how to structure the data, right? Nothing about the visualizations yet because, that's, because we're following the pipeline. Then we have trees. Um, a tree is a special type of network or graph, right? Uh, because if you think about a tree, like just think about this, this tree here down here. Well, actually, if you think about it, it is a graph because it's about uh, people or in this case, they're people, but just nodes, items. And, and these nodes or items, they're connected to each other somehow, right? Well, this guy's connected to this guy. What, what that connection actually means in a tree is that this guy is somehow hierarchical in a, in a, in a higher hierarchical level compared to this other guy down here for whatever that means. I don't know what this means, if it's some kind of a company or apparently not, but I don't know. Or apparently, yes, I guess. Maybe this guy's the boss of this guy and this guy's the boss of these three guys and so on. Um, whatever that means. What, hap what, what, uh, what matters is that there is a link between them. You know, and, and links mean different things in different networks, depending on the data set. So a tree is a special type of network. And what's the difference between a tree and, and just a graph in general? Well, the, the, the difference is that each node has only one parent. So parent, so to speak. So this guy, this guy here is the parent of this guy here. Now notice that one parent does not mean one child, right? So this guy, and again, child conceptually speaking, this guy has two ch children, uh, but each of these children only has one parent, right? Um, so that, that actually doesn't work for like family <laughs> trees, which is interesting to think about. But anyway, um, there's also some, some other uh, thing about trees, which is that you, you don't have connections between um, the connections only go downwards. So yeah, exactly, <laughs> this is what I meant. You don't have this, you see, uh, right here. I would never have a connection between this guy, this uh, woman and this man like this, because that would break, the, that would not be a tree anymore, that would be a graph. The restriction here is that the relationships, they only go, let's say downwards, right? Never to the side and never, I mean, upwards, you have an you have one relationship with your parent, but you would never have a relationship between this woman, for example, and this guy over here. Let's say, you guys see my mouse, right? When I move like this, just to confirm. Yes, we do. Okay, cool. Yes, we do. Uh, thank you. 
yeah, so this is, uh, the, so to just think of a three, of a tree as a um, constrained graph, a graph with some extra constraints that make it uh, special. Yeah, and, and this is this is basically it for the structured data sets because as I saw, as I told you in the beginning, uh, we were only going to talk about specifically data tables and networks and trees. There are other, again, there are other possible data set types, structured data set types, uh, where you take some source of data and then you turn it into a structure in a different way. I don't know, like data streams and so on. And they're not, it's not that they're less important, it's just that since we have to focus, then we, we have to focus. And, uh, and I, I, I thought that tables and networks are probably the most interesting for you. And I believe that 95% of you will use either a table or a network or a combination of both in your projects. I don't, I don't believe that you're gonna come up with some crazy data structure in a completely different way. So I, for, I hope this is useful. And then of course we talked about the attribute types like different categorical types, um, which, is, which means, sorry, different, different categorical data, which means that the, the different categories are simply different to each other. Just as a quick recap, they don't have any other relationship. On uh, ordinal data, which is that they're still categorical, but they are ordered. So one is actually comes after the other. And then there's quantitative data, which are actually numbers. So they are ordered, but they are also just, they have relations like mathematical relationships between them. You know, they can be added, subtracted and so on. And now we're back to the pipeline and now we're actually gonna move on to the mappings, the visual mappings as they're called, which is take a data table. And again, table is not really a good word here. Just, so just think about structured data. Take your structured data that you have in your disk or whatever, and turn them into a visual abstraction. We discussed this last time, the, the difference between visual abstraction and views is not super clear, but, it, but when you think about visual abstraction, I want you to think more in terms of visual concepts uh, and less about the specific details of how they are going to be shown in the screen like the colors or the shapes that they're gonna use and so on. We are gonna talk about more like visual structures or ways to, to present information visually. And visual structures, so visual structures extend a spatial medium with visual elements and graphical properties in order to code information. So this is very interesting. You're coding information using visual elements and graphical properties, right? So that's, I guess, like, the most basic tenet of visualization. You're using some kind of uh, visual element and uh, in order to convey information. Some kind of visual element, of course, is very open. We're gonna talk about that, but it's still. Uh, the mapping to a visual structure should reflect the data table. And again, just think of this data table as structured data. The mapping should reflect the structured information that you have about your data, right? Always. Uh, you should always avoid to have something in your visualization that comes out of nowhere. Like there's some things I put there just because they look cool, but they actually don't have a connection to my, specifically to the structured data that I have. Try not to do that unless it's absolutely necessary. Try to make sure that whatever you do is actually connected to, to structure, the structured data that you have. Okay. Of course, it's, it's rare that you're gonna be completely able to do that all the time, but still the, the effort to minimize this is very important. To find a good mapping is often very difficult because there are so many different uh, possibilities. And sometimes we're used to something and then we want to use that even though some, something else might be better. A mapping is expressive if all and only the data in the data table are also represented in the visual structure. Again, that relates to what I said before. In order to make a, an expressive visual mapping, make sure that you're only representing the structured data. And actually, if you can, you're representing all of the structured data somehow. Because if, you're, if, something else, if something is left behind, then it's missing from the visualization. And, and then there must be a very good reason for that to be missing from the visualization. If not, everything should be there. 
and a mapping is more effective if it's faster to interpret. Can COVID convey more distinctions and le or leads to fewer errors? These things are very abstract. Like what, is, what does it mean to be faster to interpret, right? That in order to determine that you have to do user experiments, which some people do, but we are not necessarily doing right now. At, although you will do something like that at the end. But, um, but you can say that something is more effective. Th these are three like general ways of, of analyzing that. If it's faster to interpret, can convey more distinctions, and or leads to fewer errors when, when interpreting the data. And, and this is an example that I think you're actually gonna see in, the, in, in Andrea's lectures if you didn't see it already, but uh, so I'm not gonna extend myself here, but basically it's just, it's just an idea like, okay, here I design, I, I, so I have a, a sine wave, that's my structured data, right? Before the visualization. And then I have two options to, to visualize that. One is by drawing something like this, uh, which is something that is very familiar. I guess you look at it and you're, yes, that's a, that's a sine wave. I can see that perfectly. But actually this mapping on the top here, that actually is also a mapping of the sine wave because you can see that the values here, the Y axis here, is actually mapped into colors, right? Using a specific color map, which I probably ha should have uh, added some somewhere here, the actual color map. Um, but the, but if if you see if you can see that, for example, this color, this color, and this color, they're exactly the same, and for a, a very good reason, because in these three places here and here and here, the y value is zero. So zero is mapped to this brown color, and then you have yellow here, which means like a high value here of one. And you have this other dark blue here, which means zero, um, minus one, sorry. Uh, so the, so this, this color map goes from, from dark blue to bright yellow as it goes from minus one to one, right? And then it goes in, 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 the, in between, it goes through like brown and orange and purple and so on. That's actually a very well-known color map. I think it's magma, if I'm not mistaken, or plasma, one of the two. Then, so, so you can see that this is actually, they are actually the same, mapping the same thing, but this one is probably much more familiar to you. Uh, so this, these are things that you should consider when you're actually doing your project to, in order to make sure that you, that you choose a certain visual mapping that even though it's correct, you should choose something that's you know, effective or that you believe is effective or that you can somehow argue for its effectiveness because of whatever reason. Visual mappings of tables. Uh, okay, visual mappings of tables. Again, now we're going, we're going back to the, to the actual tables. So we're gonna do the same thing now. We're gonna go through tables as we did before, but now in a more uh, advanced uh, way. And then we're gonna go through networks and possible visual mappings for networks also in order to make sure we stand on that specific uh, step of the pipeline, right? A scatter plot is probably the most common way of representing a, visually a table, okay? I hope you guys understand what I, what I mean when I say table. I mean like this thing with rows and columns and so on. So scatter plot is very, very common. In this case, it's, this is a 3D scatter plot, right? Which is not as common and not as effective as a 2D scatter plot. Uh, because the screen of the computer is 2D. So every time you're looking at something that's 3D, you're looking at a projection, at, at, a, at, a, at a 2D projection of that 3D data set, that original 3D data set. So you're never looking at, at an actual 3D thing because you know, we, we can only see 3D in our, let's say natural environment. We cannot see that in, the, in, a, in an actual computer screen. All we see in a computer screen is one t, 2D view of a 3D thing. And, and that, that hurts a little bit the, the interpretation because of the depth. So not, it, we, we can't always understand perfectly the depth of things in a computer, right? Because it's not 3D. So, so even though a scatter plot, a scatter plot is by far the most, the most common, and I would say even the most effective way to uh, convey structured information in the format of a table or multidimensional information, as we say. 
And that is because if you go back to, unfortunately, I don't have it here and I'm, I'm not going to uh, risk going back there to, to find it. But if you, if you go back and look at that uh, taxonomy that we saw last time at the very end of our lecture, you will see that Tamara Munzner uh, defines that mapping data along a certain axis is the most effective way of mapping quantitative attributes, right? So if you have two, two attributes or two features or two dimensions, then it, it is also, uh, you can also conclude that having two axes is also the most uh, eff efficient or effective, I guess, way to convey quantitative information when you have two of them. And then of course you, want, you, you, you map these axes as usually <laughs> as orthogonal axes because you assume that they're independent and you just map them as two orthogonal axes because they're independent. Um, so, and then, and then you draw them on the screen because if you, don't, if, you, if you don't consider them as being independent or orthogonal, then you're potentially distorting your data, right? So you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, it's not something you do. But then, but then you see the problem here is that, I mean, I understand uh, right now this thing is rotated, right? So it's slightly rotated, but I could, I could draw two orthogonal axes like price and time. They could be completely orthogonal like this. And then I can draw a 2D scatter plot. But as soon as I add a new axis, a third one, I, 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 cannot, I cannot draw an, a completely perfectly orthogonal third axis in a 3D screen because that axis would actually come out of the screen or go in the screen, right? Uh, because that's, that's what an orthogonal axis would be, right? It, it would either, either come up or go down or both ways. Uh, and that's not possible. <laughs> obviously so yet who knows in the future so you end up drawing something uh and then rotating it a little bit like what we did here but as soon as you rotate it a little bit i guess you 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 agree with me that it has distorted it because now price and time is not they're not orthogonal anymore i mean you can interpret them as being orthogonal because you can kind of look at, at them from the side like this or imagine that you're looking at them from the side like this and then you say yeah okay i understand that but um but the truth is that you've distorted them because that's a 2D projection of a 3D thing. And as you do that, you distort the data also. And as you distort the data, if you don't have a very clear way to, to conveying the depth of, of something, of, of these things, then it's all, it's all around. It's, it's very, really, really complicated to determine exactly whether you're, you're having an effective visualization or not, okay? So just keep it in mind that you cannot simply map, map a 3D uh, data set into a 3D scatter plot and that's it, okay? That's not it. One interesting possibility is to use different marks and channels. That is uh, very common. I, I, I won't be adventurous and say that this is better than, than the 3D you know, orthogonal axis thing because I don't know. <laughs> I can't say that. I'm, uh, scientifically speaking, I can't, I can't tell you because I've, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there, there are some studies out there that could affirm, could make a comparison between these two things. I'm, I don't know. But the idea here is that, okay, you have two orthogonal axes, the x-axis and the y-axis, and they are, you know, using the best possible channel, which is this, this channel of, you know, mapping things around an axis. And then you just use color, for example, in order to represent something or area. So in this case, we discussed this last time. This is a normal scatter plot. And then there is something mapped to the color, which is, if I'm not mistaken, continent. So different colors here means different continents, I guess. I'm not sure, but I think like blue is Europe and um, yellow is Asia or something like this. And the area is the actual size of the country. So biggest bigger countries are, are larger circles. So I guess this is, some of these are, well, India, China, United States, Brazil, or something like that. The, the, the largest one, Canada. And the smaller ones are probably like European countries, which are a bit smaller. So, uh, so you know, this, this is, in, in this case, 
there are four different variables being represented here. And you couldn't, even if you wanted, you couldn't even uh, draw a 4D scatterplot. I mean, you can draw a 3D scatterplot using 3D computer graphics, but you can't draw a 4D scatterplot in a, in a completely natural, intuitive way. That, that's just not a thing. Uh, but in this case, you, you do have four different dimensions being shown at the same time. And it's perfectly fine. I mean, I, is it effective? Is it efficient? I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. But, but it's, I mean, it's fine. It's there. It's using colors, using areas. And I, I guess you can interpret that. And I guess if you can, you know, lead your user through it and, and do it in a nice way, uh, why not? Another solution, and even I, I really don't know why this, these pictures are so low resolution. I have to fix that later. Well, one solution would be to project along all three axes. So what we have here is, again, uh, it's not a 2D, well, it's, it's a 3D, it's the same data set as before us, well, at least the same data set as this one, but it's projected three times on the screen for the three possible combinations of axes. So bedrooms and against price, priced against time and time against bedrooms. Uh, and this is for a 3D data set, right? So then you have three scatter plots. Well, I mean, there are problems with this. Uh, you have to analyze three different things at the same time. You can find relationships between pairs of variables, but I would say it's probably very hard to find relationships between all the three variables at the same time. But anyway, finding relationships about them at the same time is, is hard anyway. So is it harder like this or is it harder like the other one? Hmm. I'm not sure. I would guess if, uh, I, can't, I can't say for sure, but I would guess that a 3D scatter plot will probably be still be better if you can give the user some nice interactions and ways to rotate it and to, to interact with it in a nice way. Nothing is perfect, okay? When it comes to, to three or four dimensions or more, nothing is perfect. So, so I don't know. I would guess that probably a 3D scatter plot with a nice rotation scheme and, and, and nice interactions would probably be better than this. Another one that's also very common is scatter plot matrix. It's basically the same thing that we had here, or not the same thing, but it's very similar. So, so the relationships are mapped three times separately, but you group them together in a certain way that they share axes. So for example, this, this axis here is price and this, is, this here is time, right? So price against time. And this one is bedrooms. So this is price against bedrooms. Even though you don't have the names here, they're connected in a certain way that the price axis is shared between these two uh, graphs here, these two scatter plots here. And then time is here and, and here, unfortunately, one of them have to be like rotated like this because there's no other way. But then you have bedrooms here. So but again, these two guys share the bedrooms axis here and uh, time is here. So this is time against bedrooms. So theoretically, that would be a little bit better than this one because then you're sharing access. So you're kind of compressing the information a little bit and it could be a bit easier to interpret, but it's, I mean, scatterplot matrices are really very, very much used, okay? They're, they're quite popular for, for most dimensional data. I wouldn't dare to tell you for sure whether they are super effective or not, I, because I couldn't. So they exist, they exist, they're there. And if, you, if you're doing something and you, and it, sparks an idea in you and says, well, maybe a scatterplot matrix would work here. By all means, go ahead, because they are actually very popular. And then you will argue for this. Well, I chose a, a scatterplot matrix because I think that it works with this and that. Perfectly fine. Another, uh, another interesting uh, example here is this thing with a scatterplot matrix with brushing. So usually scatterplot matrices have brushing. What, does, what is brushing? Brushing is selecting things in a visualization. So for example, in this case, 
I, uh, the author selected these two points and then you see where these two points are in the other visualizations. And this is very important. I want to take some, uh, a, a few seconds here to, to talk about this because this is not only for scatter plot matrix, right? Whenever we start getting out of the domain of two dimensional data or even three dimensional data as we will go towards much more complicated data sets, interaction is going to be not only invaluable, but probably you cannot, you cannot do anything without interaction actually, I would say. That's one of the most important tenets of visual analytics. Visual analytics is about people, users interacting with your visualization in order to obtain insights somehow. So visual analytics is inherently about the fact that a simple static visualization cannot convey all the information that, that is, exists in large and complex data sets. So then you, you need the visualizations, but you also need the interaction. And you also need a bunch of other stuff, but basically, whenever, again, whenever we go away from the very simple examples of two and 3D data and then we go to 5D or 10D or 100 dimensions, then you will need interaction, period. So just, just keep it in mind that, for example, <laughs> just keep it in mind that, for example, this one, this one data set, it, even though it's very simple, it, it could already be enhanced with interaction because by selecting these two points, you can see where they are in the other visualizations and that will help you interpret something like a cluster, for example, you could interpret using it, okay? So keep that in mind. In this project course, in this course, you will need to do interactive stuff. So it, it will not be enough for you to just build a visualization period, okay? Now what's called access based, let's say, or, um, well, let's just call it access based. The most common uh, visualization of, of that type is parallel coordinates. And the, the interesting thing here is that, it, is that it's called parallel coordinates because we, we break away from, from this idea of having orthogonal axes like this, like price against time, which is uh, they are orthogonal to each other. Uh, we break away from that and then we put every axis parallel to each other. So in this case, for example, I have, let's say I have five different uh, variables. So this is variable one, this is variable two, this is variable three, this is variable four, this is variable five. You could have more, you could have like 10 or 15 even, depending on how you arrange them in the screen. Uh, and, and I guess in a wide screen, you can even have even more of them. So you draw them in parallel like this, and then each data point becomes actually one uh, line seg or, or a connection of like line segments. So what, what we usually call a polyline. So this red thing here, the whole thing is, has to be interpreted as one element. So this element here, since it has values in each of the dimensions, then you just make this polyline so, so that it intercepts each axis on the, the points where they, where, where that data point actually has that value, so, right? So, I mean, for variable one, it has a value of something like this, and then for variable two, it has a value of a little bit more, and then for variable three, is a, it has a, a value that's very close to zero, and so on and so forth. So every line like this is one data point, okay? Or not every line, not every, every polyline, every collection of line segments. Uh, it's a, it's, and this technique is super well known and super popular, right? This is what happens um, when you do, when you make, well, when you plot a lot of them, right? So you, when you have thousands of data points and then you plot them in, in, in a parallel coordinates visualization, and then you see something like this. Um, of course, this one actually is, it's enhanced a little bit because this is from this Parvis, um, software, which I don't even know if uh, it exists anymore because it's a relatively old. 
but it's very representative anyway. Uh, so, so you see how the parallel coordinates themselves, just, just the parallel coordinates, it's usually not enough, right? Uh, you need to have some interaction and you need to have some visual enhancements also. Like for example, so, so just so you understand what's happening here, each of these uh, coordinates, parallel coordinates are some kind of a variable, right? So dissipation rate, pressure, TK energy, turbulence, velocity, and so on. And they all have some kind of a lower limit and some kind of a maximum limit here. And as you can see, the axis, all of them are, they, they have their own ranges. Like this one goes from what, something five to the minus five to 74, while this one goes from minus 1618 uh, 1, to 1848, doesn't matter. They're completely independent to each other. They, they all have their own ranges. And then you just plot the points, all of them. But if you just plot all the points with the same color, for example, then you end up with a lot of clutter and you just don't see anything because it's all, basically everything's covered, right? So usually what happens is that you add some kind of an interaction, like for example, in this case, you have this uh, axis-based interaction where you take an axis like, I don't know, tur turbulence velocity, and then you set a, a range here like you, you, you come here and you select, okay, I only want those points that, are, that go from here to here. And then you see that all of the other points, they get a little bit blurred out. They, be, they kind of go to the background in a way. And, and then you only focus, highlight on the actual ones that you want. So by selecting in one dimension, then I can, I can check what are the patterns that it forms in other dimensions. So for example, I can see that the points that go through here in this specific uh, range, they, I'm not sure if this range is uh, correct because these, these ones on top here are not uh, included, but these, these ones here that are going through this range, they also like, they, they go all the way down. Usually they go down here in this other one, this velocity. So they don't go up. So most of the points that go up here in this area here, they're not part of the selection. So that could be like one of the insights that you get. Well, those points that go through this range here, they go through this range here instead of going up, I guess. You know, you, you can see that, so that's interesting. And I'm not sure if, um, yeah, that's it. So star plots now are a little bit uh, similar to parallel coordinates, but instead of putting the axis in parallel, you put them all in a concentric circle. So you, they all start from the same origin here and then they go in all possible directions. So here you have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So we have 11 dimensions here or 11 features or 11 variables. And they are all arranged uh, in this like web thing and all starting from the same origin. And then again, like the same, the same way that you did with the parallel coordinates, you, you take a point and you plot it by intercepting the axis in the right place for each one. And then you form, so what, what's interesting in, in this case, however, is that contrary to this, that you get like a polyline, an open polyline, what you get here is an actual polygon. You, you get an actual shape, a closed shape. So when you plot a data point like this, and then you get a shape, then you can compare these shapes roughly in order to, you know, uh, make it, to have insights about these data points and actually compare them and actually uh, try to understand better the differences in the, in the, in the common things. So for example, one thing that, that for me uh, is very uh, visible here is that Vermont has a much larger polygon than the rest. And unfortunately, I don't remember exactly what it means, physics, chemistry, and biology, but I, I, don't, I don't remember what are these, these, these axes, unfortunately. Um, but, but you can see that Vermont has a much larger uh, symbol here. And then the, the actual shapes of these um, states, they actually tell you a lot of stuff. Like for example, Connecticut with New Hampshire, they're, they're quite similar, I would say so. 
even though New Hampshire is a little bit larger, but they, they have roughly a very similar shape. So that means that for, for this specific data set, these two uh, states are quite similar, right? While if you take some other, like Pennsylvania, it kind of looks very different. Maybe you can compare this a little bit with New Jersey. Maybe it, it kind of has a little bit of a shape close to, to New Jersey, but not much. Uh, it feels like a little bit of an outlier. And so on, right? This is visualization. So these, these are all uh, insights that you can take by looking at the data. And, and the fact that you can uh, build a little bit of a polygon here out of the, uh, each, each data point. So just, just to make sure you guys understand, each of these states is one data point, right? Represented in this specific form. And of course, you can simply plot them all in, at, you, can, I can, you can either take them separately like this or you can take them all in the same place like this and depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, yeah, and uh, star plots is uh, a little bit, well, I would say that um, it's a little bit similar to this one, but you can, uh, you can, I guess it's the difference here is that sometimes you have, um, well, I guess what I meant here in these two slides, I got confused now, but what I meant here was that you can either draw them separately like this, or you can draw them all in the same, in the same place here. Because I was, sorry, I was confusing because there's another thing called star coordinates. And for some, for some reason, I thought I had jumps to star coordinates here, but I see now that I didn't. So there both, this is actually the same thing. So basically it's just another way to explain how to, how to uh, draw this thing. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, and, and again, you can either draw them all on top of each other or you can draw them separately like this. And I guess it will depend on what you wanna do. If you want to see big, big patterns into the whole thing, then you probably want to draw them all on top of each other, but you might end up with something crazy like this and then you have to, to filter it somehow or else it might get really confusing. Uh, uh, we saw we saw one very very modern very recent example of this. Maybe you don't remember, but when we were uh, talking about visual analytics in the introduction, there was one application uh, of the that visualization of clustering, which was which was using these kinds of um, star shaped things to represent different quality measures for the clusterings. So that's, that's one interesting uh, recent example. If you have a clustering and you can't evaluate it with just one quality measure, you need uh, several of them, then you can use one of some, something like this in order to do that. So, so if you're curious, go back to our slides from the visual analytics introduction, and which was the first thing we did, and then look for that visualization of clustering. Uh, and you will see something like this in the left-hand side. Then there is uh, dimensionality reduction, which is uh, actually part of, well, one of my core research topics, something that is very current, very much like a state of the art, very much uh, recent and, and very interesting. So dimensionality reduction kind of breaks away from all these things that we've been discussing so far, because so far what happened was that we found some way to represent all of the axes or all of the dimensions at the same time, no matter what, we, we found a way. With dimensionality reduction, we're actually gonna kind of compress the data in a way. So, um, so we're gonna map it, we're gonna, we're gonna think of DR as a function that takes a very high dimensional input like this with n data points and p dimensions, the full thing. Then you're gonna do something here and in, in the output, instead of being p dimensions, it's gonna be q dimensions. So we actually reduced the dimensionality of the data. And the idea is that you should do this in a way that is like compressing data, like when you compress a movie or when you compress audio or something like this. You, you want to do it in a way that you don't lose too much information. Because the truth is that most of the time you gather a lot of information, you gather a lot of dimensions, but you don't need all of that actually. If you, if you compute correlations and things like that, then you will see that many dimensions are sometimes not really that informative. 
or maybe they, they just convey the same information or a very similar information that another dimension already conveys. And what you do with, with uh, dimensional net reduction is that, is that usually, I mean, there are many methods, but usually what you want is to reduce it as much as possible, but in a way that you don't lose so much information, okay? So the input is a matrix of n elements by p features and the output has the same number of rows, or, I mean, the, the same data points, but much, much fewer dimensions. This is, this is an interesting simulation of something called the principal component analysis. And um, I guess that some of you already have seen this, or even most of you, because I guess you saw something about this in um, 40 V8 or 40 V660. Um, I don't think you went into too many details, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, or as far as I understand, uh, that course didn't really go into much details about it, and we won't all either. Uh, maybe on a 40V510, uh, maybe, not maybe, yeah, actually we will do that in 40V510, but uh, with a slightly more um, focus on state of the art instead of the basics. But anyway, principal components analysis is one way to reduce the dimensions such that we want the new dimensions to have as much variance as possible. Now, this simulation here is not really that uh, accurate because we're not reducing the dimensions specifically here, right? Um, it's just, a, it's just an, an illustration of what kinds of optimizations happen when you're running, for example, PCA or other dimensional reduction. Because if you have the data set as it is on the left-hand side here, you have just a 2D data set, right? It has a, an X-axis and a Y-axis. And then let's say this is your data set. Well, if you look at the variance, both in the X-axis and in the Y-axis, you will see that there is quite a lot of variance, but that's, that's for sure not the maximum variance of the data set. The maximum variance of the data set would be in, in an axis that would go this way, if, if that axis existed, which originally it doesn't. But if it did, and you, and you drew a line this way, like oh, this way like this, you would get the maximum variance in the data set. And that's what we see here in this optimization. So basically what PCA is doing is, it's trying to draw an axis through the data such that that axis, when you, so when you take the data and you project that data into that, that new axis, that projection has the maximum variance possible for the data set. And in this case, it's this, this diagonal axis over here. And then what happens is that you, after you do this, you actually use this new axis as your new dimension for your data. So you ignore the original two dimensions that were this x-axis and this y-axis, and you take this new axis over here that you just created, and you use that as your new dimension. So let's say, for example, that we, what we were doing here is we were going to reduce the dimensions from two to one, right? Let's say we want to do that. That's dimensionality reduction. Even though it's a very simple example, usually we go from uh, 500 to three, for example, uh, which is much more extreme. But in this case, it's still dimensionality reduction. We're, we're trying to go from 2D to 1D. And actually, w the, the new 1D dimension that we would have, we would discard the original ones, would be this axis that goes, um, all the way in this diagonal here. And then the new points that you would see, uh, the, the, you would see the same number of points because no point is discarded, right? But the new points that you would see would be these points that you're seeing uh, that are being projected, the red points. The red points that are being projected into the axis, those would be the new points in a one dimensional data set. So for some reason, let's say you have a two dimensional data set, but you cannot deal with two dimensions. You have to deal with just one. Well, that would be the optimal way to do it if, you would, if your goal would be to uh, maintain the maximum variance of the data set, which is an interesting goal because maintaining variance means 
you maintain, in a way, information about your data set, right? Because if you don't have variance, then you, you lose a lot of information. It's one way of losing information, not the only one, but it's one way. This is another example uh, of the same concept, but when we go through to, from three dimensions to two dimensions. Now, of course, this is 3D, but it's very hard to see this as a 3D thing, although it is 3D. Uh, or it was 3D originally, actually. Um, so, so this is a 3D data set that's in, in, in a 3D space, although it's hard to see it. But then we're going from 3D to 2D because I want to plot them, this data set on the screen using just two axes because that's how you, I mean, that's, that's how you show things in a, in, a, in a screen with two axes. So one thing you can do is run a PCA here because the PCA here will find the first person principal component which is the single direction of maximum variance possible. Then it will find the second principal component, which is the, or the, the direction that is orthogonal to the first one and also has maximum variance of all the possible orthogonal directions of the first uh, PC. And in that case, for example, is this one. And then when you project this into 2D using these two new axes that you just generated, then you get something like this, because this is the first PC that you see here, and this is the second PC, which is what you see here. Now I just, you kind of just rotate it a little bit in order to, because, because now you have new axes, right? The old axes don't mean anything anymore. Uh, so then it, then it looks rotated. Uh, but then you have uh, this 2D, and it's, this is this is a very common visualization nowadays uh, for 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 complex data sets. Although PCA is already outdated a little bit, it's actually heavily outdated, if I may say so. Um, so so it doesn't really apply that well for very complicated data sets usually. TSNE is a much more interesting, much more modern, and much better. Well depending on what better means, but most of the time is, is, is better in most ways uh, than PCA. Even though, again, guys, don't get me wrong, PCA is good because it's very rigid, it's very uh, mathematically um, formal. And so, so it really, there's a very strong mathematical foundation that says that PCA really shows you the best possible visualization if you're looking for maintaining variance, okay? But that's not always what you want. Like for example, TSNE is a much more flexible thing, okay? TSNE uh, does not worry about this, this, um, this explicit connection that exists between the original space to the left and the final space to the right, okay? This in, PCA has a very strict mathematical foundation that makes it sure that there is a very explicit connection here, a very explicit mathematical connection between these two things. And, and this is actually, theoretically, you can say that PCA is the best possible representation of a data set in, in less dimensions when it comes to the squared error, okay? The sum of squared errors, let's say, of the projection. That it's actually the optimal way. But if you are not really interested in that, because you're, most of the time you're not, because most of the time you're dealing with much more complex data. So if you look, if you do take the, the best possible, you know, variance um, view, like using PCA, then you basically don't see anything in the end because it doesn't, it doesn't it's not, uh, the visualization is not good because it's just too, too messy. Unfortunately, for some reason, I don't have a comparison here. I should. Uh, I will add it next time. Maybe I can uh, record a bonus video for you about this. Uh, actually, we're going to talk about this in 4DV510, most of you. So if some of you are not in 4DV510 and you're interested in, com in a comparison between PCA and TSNE, for example, send me a message and I will, I will f f uh, do that for you. Or else we do it, we do it in 510. So, Okay, so TSNE is much more flexible. TSNE is, is, has a, this, this very complex uh, nonlinear optimization process that uh, takes some data from, from very, very high dimensional spaces and just tries to project them into 2D or to, to create a visualization in 2D where basically uh, similar things will stay close to each other, okay? 
And I, I, I can't go too much into this because again, we're gonna see all of this again in 510. But, um, but basically just think about this. It doesn't care too much about the fact that two things that are very far away from each other, it doesn't care too much about that. So it just says, you know what? Those things that are far away from me, they're somewhere, I don't care. But the close things, those things, those things that are similar to me, I want them to be close to me. And that's why, for example, what you see here is that there are groups like, for example, if you take a cluster here, this is a cluster of zeros. Then there is, there are, I think this is a cluster of ones. Yeah, this is a cluster of ones. And then the twos, these are the cluster of twos, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, these are the clusters of twos. Oh yeah, of course, I, I forgot to tell, to tell you, but this is MNIST and I guess everyone knows MNIST, so I don't really have to explain what MNIST is. If, I'm, if that's not true, please let me know and I will explain what MNIST is because I kind of assume that everyone has seen this before. But this is what you see when you try TSNE from uh, using MNIST. Uh, and the reason why you see so, so, such great, nicely separated clusters is that actually TSNE does create some artificial clustering in a way. Um, those clusters are not necessarily in the data originally. You're not necessarily seeing a perfect illustration of the original or, or, of, or a faithful illustration of the original data set. You would see that if you tried PCA, but then it would be so messy that you wouldn't see anything. So TCNE kind of breaks away with that and lets it, it, it kind of says, okay, you know what? I don't care much about being rigid. I will be flexible. So I will optimize a different objective function that, that uh, prioritizes close neighbors. And then you see these clusters. But as, as people have been criticizing a lot lately, uh, the actual clusters themselves, they don't always, they're not always related to itself because they're far away. And like I said before, TSNE doesn't care about things that are far away. So for example, maybe you take a zero here and then you take these, some other cluster here. This one is the six. And they're not necessarily related just because they're close to each other like this, okay? They're, they're not necessarily related. They're, they're just different clusters. And if you see a bunch of white space like this, you just consider that, that there's a wall here or something like this. Because, because it, it, TSNE has been criticized a lot lately for not keeping global distances, only local distances, as we say. And some new techniques are doing that. And uh, even some new TSNE improvements are doing that. Uh, but there are also some newer, uh, dimensionality reduction techniques that are also doing that. And we're gonna discuss them a little bit in uh, 510. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about networks and the possible visual mappings for networks or graphs, if you will. And there are very, very, uh, like, like I said before, usually when you think about drawings on networks, I'm willing to bet that you were you think about straight line drawings like this one, because that's kind of like the, the most common ones, right? But there are many other ways you could do it with the polylines, uh, and again by polyline I mean these these lines, this sequences of line segments like this, uh, orthogonal. For example, sometimes you you want to draw them with orthogonal angles like this, uh, and so on and so forth. It depends a lot on, on the characteristics, characteristics of the data set itself and what you're trying to convey. Um, but in general, every gra graph layout should be easy to read and to understand, easy to remember and have a certain aesthetic uh, characteristic to it, right? Uh, for example, in this case here, um, these two things, the, the, these two drawings are basically the same graph but drawn in different ways. So you can see that probably the right hand side is, I would say you would agree with me that it's easier to read than the left hand side. Why exactly that is the case is not something that anyone can say for 100% sure, but usually, for example, one thing that you avoid is uh, crossing of edges. So the left hand side has many, much more edge crossings than the right, right one. But of course, this is only possible to do something like this. This is a very extreme example because it really, really is much more readable on the right hand side. 
But of course, when a graph is very complex, then it's not super easy to actually do it and actually find these kind of, um, you know, this kind of arrangement because sometimes you just have to do a trade-off. You don't have a perfect solution. Uh, so you have to trade off something with something else. Uh, but there are some uh, criteria of aesthetics that, you know, are usual in, in graph drawing algorithms. Um, because the layout itself, the, the problem is that the layout itself affects the perception of graphs. So you can draw the same graph in, in three different ways and then probably people will perceive different characteristics of the graph differently from the three different drawings. So there's no like one, uh, only one way to draw a graph. And, and if you draw a graph in two different ways, then you might be, you know, uh, leading your user to, to look at different things from the graph. Uh, but the problem is that, like I said before, sometimes you have to do a trade-off because actually uh, optimizing for all these criteria at the same time is not a simple uh, problem and uh, it's usually actually basically impossible. Uh, so most algorithms are just heuristics. So for example, in general, you want to have less edge crossings as possible, as less as possible. Uh, so I, I don't I don't know if you would uh, agree with me, but the, this this right hand side uh, graph does not seem to fulfill that very much. Uh, then there is uh, you want to have uh, well smallest area as possible. Let's say in terms of uh, well you you want this to be compressed in, uh, as much as possible. The symmetry is usually symmetry is usually good. So uh, experiments have shown that symmetry in graph drawings is usually a good thing. It, it makes it easier to interpret. Uh, don't ask me why, but that's uh, usually the case. Usually you have to have, you want to have less, uh, small as possible edge lengths. Um, so that depends on how, how you're optimizing it. But the truth is that the, 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 when, when an edge is too long, that means that two points, that or two nodes that should be connected, that should be close to each other because they're connected, they are actually far away. So when a long edge is an indication that you have placed uh, closely related nodes far away from each other. And that's not necess that's usually not very good. So, so one of the things usually people do is either uh, minimize edge lengths or simply uh, aim for a uniform edge length. So, no matter the size of the edges, all of them should be more or less the same size. And then, it, and then the interpretation is a little bit easier, but it, because even if all of them are a little bit long, then they're all long. So, so you understand them as being more or less uh, equivalent, right? The problem is when one edge is very long and then the other one is very short, and then you perceive them as being too different. You probably want uh, as few uh, bends as possible in the edges because whenever an edge bends, that adds a lot of complication to the interpretation, you know, because then you're not tracing a straight line anymore between the nodes. And then you have to actually follow the edges and see where they're bending in order to find the connections. And that is, can be complicated. And as much resolution as you can, of course, that works, that, help, that helps. This is, these are examples of crossings and bends. So you should avoid edge crossings as much as possible, avoid edge bends as much as, much as possible and avoid long edges as much as possible. And that's why that's, these are three criteria that are much better. Again, if we go back there, uh, you can see here that the edges are shorter. There is actually no edge bends here and there's actually no edge crossings either. So this is a very specific type of graph that can be drawn without edge crossings. Most of the graphs cannot be. So instead of aiming for zero edge crossings, you just aim for as little edge crossings as possible because you can never have, you can almost never have zero only on very simple examples like this one. Uh, yeah, for ex and this is an example of, of what happens when you have conflicting criteria. So in the left hand side, you have minimized edge crossings, but the symmetry is not perfect. And in the right hand side, you have a perfectly symmetric uh, drawing, but you have edge crossings in the middle. These are both the same graph shown in two different ways. Now, who knows which one is better? It's, it's complicated. Uh, there, it's just two criteria that are, that are conflict, conflicting, and then you have two different solutions, and it's hard to say exactly which one is the best one.
Uh, and it, th these kinds of, of uh, drawings, I mean, they can be drawn in many different ways, but the, usually they are drawn using this thing called, or this concept of a force directed graph drawing. So you kind of, you simulate a f like a physics, uh, some kind of a physical uh, interaction between the objects. You consider that they're connected with, for example, strings or, or they exert a gravitational force towards each other. And then you simulate that and you let this go for a while. And then at some point it, it well, hopefully not always, but if you do it right, then it reaches a certain balance. And that balance is usually the visualizations of networks that you see everywhere, right? It's this, this state of the system where there's a balance between the forces that each node is um, exerting on other nodes that are connected to it, or even those that are not connected to it, depending on the algorithm that you're using. Um, and this is, a, this is an optimization problem, right? You optimize it step by step, you run it like 500 iterations or something, and then, and then at some point you, you stop. And, you have, and you, so you have, as with all optimization problems, you have a certain error that you're, that you're trying to minimize, right? And this error is usually related to this criteria that we have determined. Very classical example, first presented in 1984. So it's really old, right? So it's, that's why it's been around so long and that people use it all the time. Uh, but yeah, it's a um, spring and better. Basically, you consider that the nodes are connected by springs. So when, you, when a spring is too uh, extended, then it tends to try to attract each other. So, so then all the springs are trying to attract the nodes at the same time and at some point they find some um some kind of um you know balance even though not all springs will will actually come back to their to their resting position so to speak because some of them will be exerting force against each other um so they will be perpetually trying to to win the fight uh, but at some point, some balance will be reached, and then that's where you stop and say, "Okay, this is this is what we have right now. This this is what we can do." Um, it has high runtime. With large graphs, it's complicated. Sometimes the the constraints are just too hard, and and, and it, you don't always see a good visualization out of that, right? And this is one example. I mean, this is not a large graph, but this is one example of something you get when you do, uh, when you use spring in better. Another, another example is layered uh, graph drawing. So in a layered graph drawing, there's a, one extra restriction, which is that some nodes are supposed to be on specific layers while other nodes are on all other layers and so on. That's usually used for trees but also it could be also for, for graphs if they are, um, you know, if they have such a constraint. It doesn't have to be a tree, it's usually a tree, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and so, so this is just like an added constraint on top of the drawing where some, some nodes have to be on certain layers while other nodes have to be in certain other layers. But there's still an optimization process here because in the layer itself, they can be interchangeable. Right, so you don't have a specific uh, order of nodes in the layer, so you can change that. So that becomes also an optimization process where you have to position the, the nodes in the layer more to the left or more to the right or change their order in such a way that again, you are somehow minimizing those, those problems we, we talked about like edge crossings and edge bends and so on and so forth. So the, the, those constraints, they, they remain here. Uh, but then you have a, an extra one, which are, which are the actual layers. And then, but still, it's still an optimization process. So, for example, these are parallel layers or radial layers here, like goes from from the center to the outside. Let's say um, the the graph itself is the same, so to speak. Not the, not they're not the same here, but I mean, the graph itself doesn't have to change here. It's just a different representation, as long as it fits right. Then we're going to start talking about trees. Um, trees are a little bit e not easier, but they, since since they have uh, they're most they're more constrained than graphs. Then the, you know that you can show them, and there's also some some more like natural ways of representing them. So usually that's also good. 
Um, and again, there, there are some criteria here like spatial efficiency. So do you use the space well? You should pro try to use the space well to not have so much waste. Um, and uh, simplicity, so simpler is better, right? And so on, there's a bunch of stuff. And then you can, for example, these are two very common ways of looking at a tree. One, one that is like what you've seen in uh, Windows Explorer, that's a tree. You know, it's, it's, uh, you, it's layered from the left to the right, uh, depending on the um, depth of the tree. And as you open the folders, you see it adds a new layer to the right and then so on to the right, to the right, to the right, and so on. Now, the right-hand side is, is also a very natural representation for the same thing. Probably not the same thing that we're seeing on the left-hand side, but, the, but for a tree. And I would guess that usually that's what people think of when they think of trees. And, um, and you see, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of room for improvements here. And for example, all these spaces that you see, or not for improvements, but for optimization, all these spaces that you see on the top side, on the top of the tree, they are related to the fact that the bottom of the tree is much more dense or much denser than the top. So if the, if the bottom nodes are arranged in a certain way, then the top ones, they must, they must stay uh, far apart like this because they, they have below them a lot more nodes that have to be somehow spaced. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why usually it's, usually it's drawn bottom up. Usually you, you start by drawing the bottom layers and then go up, but usually you go back and forth because there's, there's also the, some other optimization criteria that you have to, to check. But in this case, for example, uh, there's, you don't have to worry too much about edge crossings, for example, because due to the actual constraints of the tree, uh, there, is, there is usually not a lot of edge crossings. Bands, that could be bands because it depends on whether you want to draw straight lines or you want to actually curve the lines. But that's then again, more or less um, easy to detect because you, you have this abstraction of top down and so on and so forth. So the bands, don't really affect too much the visualization here. Uh, so, so yeah, it's very familiar, these kinds of, uh, of, of visualizations and uh, very used in many places. Uh, you can see nodes in the same level. They are in a horizontal line or a vertical line, depending on whether you rotate. And it's just simple and, and easy to see. But the problem is that it's very space consuming. And, uh, you know, like you see here, like if, if you had more nodes in the bottom layer, then you would have a lot of them and then the top ones would be very very far apart and so on so for simple trees that works perfectly but for more complicated trees it could be a problem one interesting way to to improve on that is by using these kinds of radial trees it's, it's basically the same tree as this one but instead of going up up and down you go from the center to outside and that's the same thing that that we did with a um, hierarchical graph a hierarchical layout layout uh, or layered uh, graph drawing, but now it's a tree. So basically it's the same thing. The bottom layers are on the outside, the top layers are on the inside, and then you go from the inside to the outside. And then you usually, again, you layer them first by with the outside ones because they, these are the ones that take more space. And then depending on those, you can move inside and then layer the, the, the other ones that are inside because they're a little bit easier. To, to put there. And these are examples of 3D versions of this, this idea. Very old ones, actually. Um, I don't think they're used very much anymore. People don't really use that. Um, but they are very interactive. Uh, you, cannot do, you cannot do something like this, 3D like this, without being heavily interactive, because that would never work, right? So you can actually interact with it and, and rotate it and so on, or else that would make no sense. Um, and yeah, there's um, these are node link diagrams. All of these things that we have been discussing uh, is uh, what has been called node link diagrams because they include nodes and links between the nodes, even though they may be like done in wildly different ways, but they are all node link diagrams and uh, they all have problems with scalability if, if you have two networks that are too big, they will always be a problem. And, and it's, it's kind of difficult to embed all the variables also like shape, color, size. Uh, you can do that, but it's not 
um, necessarily going to be effective because there's just too much stuff on the screen at the same time. And they all, they might possibly collide with the basic nodding structure. So it, if you add more stuff on top of that, then maybe you actually end up uh, making it less readable because you could collide with the actual node link structure that you have. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, tree maps and then we're done for today, I guess. Uh, and if there's something else that I, in my slides, I will just uh, record uh, a bonus video for you guys and post them, post it later so you can watch it. Uh, because this, this lecture is, is done today. Next week is something else completely. So tree maps, uh, tree maps are a very interesting way to look at trees that, that break away completely from that idea of node link diagram. It's still the same tree, it's still the same data source, it's still the same structured data, so to speak, but the visualization is completely different, right? So the hierarchy in this case is recursively mapped to rectangles. I don't, I don't think it makes sense to, to talk about it without looking at it, so I will go back and forth. Um, so this is a tree map. Well, one possible tree map in the right-hand side here. And basically what happens here is that A, well, so this, is, this would be a, a normal like node link representation of this very specific, uh, simple example, right? So we have A, A is apparent to B and C, B is apparent to D and E, and C is apparent to F, G and H. And they have, as you can see, they have some kind of an attribute to them. They are like A is 200, B is 80, C is 120. And I mean, each one of them has some kind of um, like a weight to them. They're not equally weighted, right? They, they don't have the same importance, so to speak. They are, they, they're a little bit different to each other. And usually that comes with your data for whatever reason. Um, it could mean anything, any, any kind of information that you're mapping to your, in, in your node. Oh, sorry. Uh, and the, the right hand side here is what this thing would look like in a tree map. So this is what, what's happening here. A is the top level, right? So A is the big, the big uh, rectangle or square in this case. And the reason why you, say, you see A here with a small like, space here is just because this is the way that we show the label of A. But this could be not, you don't necessarily have to have this, this little part here where you're seeing the A here. This could be outside. It's, this could be completely filled up by the, by the children. That would make no difference. Well, usually. So inside of A, you have two, two actually, big rectangles, you have B and you have C. And when I say you have B and you have C is because if you look at, at, at the column, so B is one column and C is another column like this. Actually, what you're actually seeing is E and D and H and G and so on. But if you think that one node is, is positioned inside the other nodes or the parents, then you see that B is the one whole column and C is one whole column. And that whole column of B is partitioned between E and D because E and D are children of B. So, they, so since they're children, they're positioned inside the, the rectangle that comprises B as a whole. In the same way that B and C were also positioned inside the rectangle of A. And, and you, as you can see, B is a little narrower and C is a little wider and that's because b and c don't have the same importance b has a little bit less importance so to speak 80 than c which is 120 so what so you see that in how the space is partitioned inside of a so it's not partitioned equally because they don't have the same importance and the same thing happens with d and e since e has a little bit more importance then it's partitioned like this horizontally uh, or vertically, well, I don't know, depends on how you see it, but let's say vertically, uh, in a way that E is a little bit larger than D because uh, it has a little bit more importance. And usually, I mean, there are many algorithms to generating a tree map, but usually you have one big rectangle, which is the root of the tree, and then you partition it either horizontally or vertically between all the children. And then you take each children and you partition again, but now using the opposite way. So if, if at first you partitioned 
horizontally, then you go in the, the, the children and then you partition vertically. But that's not necessarily has to be that. There are other algorithms. Like for example, C was not entirely partitioned in just one way. Basically, it partitioned between H and, uh, and the other ones, and then G and F are, were partitioned on the other way and so on and so forth. There are different algorithms for doing this, but what, what matters is that the children are always positioned inside the parent and then that is done recursively, so on and so forth. If, for example, uh, this, is, this is actually a news website that used to be online and I, I tried this, this link a couple of days ago and didn't work, not sure if it's working, but the link is over here on the right hand side, Marumushi. Uh, and this is this is interesting because this is a tree map where you have these different like categories of news, and these these different categories are, of news are partitioned into uh, different news, I guess, based on the importance of that news or something like this. But, uh, but as you can see, the whole thing is partitioned in small rectangles, and which are the actual categories. And then the categories themselves are partitioned again recursively into the news that are being shown for each of those categories. And there's also this relationship of some news are apparently more important at that point than the other ones that are a little bit smaller. And that's a hierarchy. It's a complex hierarchy, and, but it's, it's, it's really, really, it's a very interesting visualization technique that it's still heavily used nowadays. This is, for example, um, a final thing that I'm going to talk about today before I let you go. Um, this is, for example, one, one alternative to that one. It's still the same idea of hierarchically putting things inside of, it, of each other, but uh, they, they have explored this possibility of not necessarily using um, rectangles. So you don't, well, I mean, whether it's effective or not is another question. But this is just, just so you can see that you don't necessarily have to use rectangles if you don't want to. Um, and you might still do something, depending on what your data is. But the idea is here is still the same. You're, you're, you have stuff, you have uh, children placed inside the nose of the parents and recursively so on and so forth. Although, yeah, and, and also the same thing is done here with uh, the squares and the slice and dice. Uh, although they have some nice little um, shading of the tree maps. Now, I do still have like a couple of slides that I could show you, but uh, we all have other stuff to do. And there's nothing like too groundbreaking anyway that I still need to talk about. Um, I hope that I gave at least a good overview of the space, the design space of possible visualizations for each of the structured data that we took a look. I will repeat what I said in the beginning. This is not supposed to be an ex, uh, extensive or a comprehensive discussion. It's, um, it's an introduction, it's an overview, a compressed one in, uh, actually. But it's supposed to give you some ideas of what to do when, you, when you're out there. So you're, you're gonna have your project and you're gonna have some data and you're going to have to make decisions about that data before you even start implementing, right? So you're going to have to, to start to think about what kinds of visual mappings am I, am I going to do with um, my data, with different attributes of my data or whatever comes with my data. And uh, this was just like a taster, some possible things that you can do. And uh, whatever you decide to do, you're going to have to dig more and, and learn more about the specific things that you choose to implement, right? And of course, we're going to discuss this because we're going to come back with a proposal and everything, and we're going to have feedback on that. Uh, so I hope I gave you a uh, slightly interesting overview of, of the options that are out there. Uh, I guess that's it for today. The, this, this week, you have a deadline for uh, the groups. Um, I, didn't, I have to actually check the Moodle to see if you already submitted that. If you already did, great. Uh, there's also the, the problem that some couple of students are not active. So that changes a little bit our plans. I promise I will get back to you about this in, in the next couple of days at most. Tomorrow you have a meeting with Kostya. He's the one who's gonna handle the lecture tomorrow. 
Uh, and then you can also ask questions for him if you want, but you can also ask questions for me, or you can also send uh, messages on Moodle, forum, whatever you want. But I will, actually, we will, I will talk to Costantino. We will get back to you in the next couple of days about the actual uh, group division and assigning the data sets to each group. If you're a PhD student and you have ideas about the data that you're gonna use, please uh, also send us a quick note to, to, so that we can also start discussing that. And, uh, and I, will, I will actually record the rest of this lecture later and make it available to you together with this recording as a bonus, okay? But for now, that is it. So if you, if you don't have any specific questions, I will say goodbye, good luck, and thank you for coming.